breath. And uh, always good exercise, always good exercise. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. Tonight we're in Acts chapter 17, message entitled, Blast Off to Mars. Acts chapter 17, tonight we'll be looking at verses 18 through 21, Acts 17, 18 through 21. Let's open in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you will help us to learn not merely theology tonight, but practical application of the sound doctrine that we find in your word. Help us to learn how to live what we know, not merely talk about it, not merely think about it, not merely argue it or discuss it with others, not merely wonder whether other people are doing it. Help us to learn to obey. And help us, Father, to put it into application in a way that brings the greatest amount of glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for your word. We pray for your blessings upon it tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you recall, last week we had a very, at least in my opinion, a very important lesson in verses 16 and 17. The message was entitled, What Moves You to Action? What Moves You to Action? Verses 16 and 17, we read, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Quick overview. We saw that Paul was moved to action. He didn't really think about it or sit around and discuss it with a few people on the side. He was moved to action because his motives were grounded in the word of God and he was empowered by the spirit of God. We ask the question, what moves you to action? Are you moved to action by the Word of God, empowered by the Spirit of God and for the glory of God? Or are you only moved to action by the flesh? If it feels good, you do it. If it puts money in the bank account, you do it. If it's not inconvenient, you do it. If it's comfortable, you do it. But if it calls you to sacrifice, you avoid it. If it's an unpleasant task, you run away from it. If it's something that somebody else will do if you drag your feet, do you drag your feet? Two words, move and action. What moves you to action? It's not just a matter of thinking about it. It's a matter of action. It's not just a matter of talking about it. It's a matter of action. Like the old saying goes, talk is cheap, or put your money where your mouth is, or walk the walk, don't just talk the talk, or stop batting your lips and bat the ball. Or, as the Bible puts it in Proverbs 14:23, in all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. It's a matter of action. We need to examine our lives and ask ourselves the question, if I'm really honest with myself, I can't answer this for you, only you can answer it for you and only I can answer it for me, but if I'm really honest with myself, on average, I know there are exceptions one way and there are exceptions the other way, but if I looked at my life on average, what moves me to action? Is it the Spirit of God, or is it the flesh? What moves me to action? We learned at least six things about what moved Paul to action, and we learned some keys to help us get moving, to start moving into action. The first thing we noticed that was Paul didn't waste any time while he was waiting. He didn't waste time. As I said last week, one of the things that I hate worst is wasting time. Sometimes you get stuck with it, and for me, that is just like the end of the world. I hate to waste time. Paul was not only a man of deep thought and intense spiritual passion, he was a man of action. He didn't use the lack of a team. He was there all by himself, but he didn't use the lack of a team as an excuse for doing nothing. 
There are many churches that lack a team spirit where people who should be participating drag their feet and wait for somebody else to act even when they know it's their job. But he didn't care whether there was somebody there or not. He was moved to action. The passage is a reminder to me as a leader that the failure of others to carry out their part of the load does not give the pastor the right to use their failure as an excuse for him to do nothing. We know this, but we don't always believe it. You see, they will have to give an account to Christ someday for wasting their own time, and I will have to give an account to Christ someday for wasting my time and making other people's time less effective than it could be in ministry. Remember, time is one of the most valuable gifts that God has ever given to us. You don't know when your time on earth will end. That was certainly driven home to me when God took Judy. When you fail to fill time with something that's valuable, you're doing at least five things. These are what we covered in detail last week, but let me just run them through quickly for you. First, you're wasting a resource given to you by God. Why should he give you more of it? So by wasting time, you may actually be shortening your life. If God gives you money and you waste it, why should he give you more? If he gives you good health and strength, why should he give you more? If he gives you time and you waste it, why should he give you more? Second, you're not just wasting time. You're wasting your life because that's what life is made of. You can't waste time. You can only waste your life. And you've only got one of those. Third, you're setting a bad example for younger believers in the faith. That's a serious issue. And we've talked about that in great detail in the past. God will chasten you severely for causing a young in the faith Christian to stumble and to fall into sin. Fourth, when you waste time, you're setting an example that can be mocked by diligent unbelievers. They see you and they say, you're a Christian and that's how you use your time. You talk to me about how much and how important things of heaven are and yet I see you not using your time. If I were a Christian, I mean, I certainly would have more zeal and emphasis in, in the way I used my time. Fifth, you're losing eternally valuable heavenly rewards that otherwise you could be gathering with that use of time. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later on. I want to show you how much emphasis there is on that particular point as we get into our text tonight. But you're losing eternally valuable heavenly rewards that otherwise you could be gathering with that time that you're wasting. And I'm afraid none of us take that as seriously as we should. I'm going to read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 through 15 again. I read this passage last week, but I think I want to read it again because it emphasizes and helps us to understand what happens next in our text tonight. Beginning in verse, three of first, uh, verse 7 of 1 Corinthians 3. Paul is talking about the different obligations and responsibilities and gifts that God has given to each one of us who are believers. If you are a believer, you have at least one, and I'm convinced more than one, of the uh, spiritual gifts that are listed for us in the scripture. There are 22 of them. Seven of them were temporary, but 15 at least still remain. Seven related to the reception and proclamation of new special revelation as the New Testament was being given. But when it was completed, those temporary gifts were extinguished by the Spirit of God. But there are at least 15 that still are available, and God has given to every believer at least one, and I think probably more than one, and he places them in each individual local church for the edification of that church and the testimony of Christ at large. So that's the context that we have here about using what God has given to us and the different responsibilities that each one of us has as we serve Christ. Beginning in verse 7. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward. We're going to keep this in mind here. Shall receive his own, not somebody else's, his own reward according to his own labor. Your labor, your works, are tied to your rewards. Not tied to your salvation, but tied to your rewards. What you're going to get when you get to heaven. For where your labor is together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. 
according to the grace of God, and so he's moving from the planning illustration to building a building illustration. According to the grace of God, which is given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereupon. But let every man, all of us are building, folks, let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For the foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So all Christians are building on that foundation. You have no other options in terms of foundations. The foundation has been laid. But you are building on it. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, there's one category, wood, hay, stubble, there's another category, it's going to come to a point of testing. Every man's work, not every man's faith, not every man's ideas, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. <clears throat> Looks good on the outside right now, but you put the torch to it and find out it's made out of paper mache. You know, you probably have seen some of the old, old black and white movies, and you look at it and you just groan and you say, those props look so unreal. <laughs> hey, you know, you can test what the props are made out of. Is it really made out of massive blocks of stone? For example, if you've ever been to Israel, you, you've seen there at the, the Wailing Wall, on the right at the bottom of the Temple Mount area, these humongous Herodian stones. I mean, 16, 20 feet long, 8 feet tall, with a, a special way that it's engraved around the border of each one of those. Multiple tons each. Now, you could make a wall that looks out, out of paper mache that looks like that, but you know, if you put a blowtorch to the one, nothing happens. Might get a little soot on it. Put a blowtorch to the other, and it goes up in smoke. There's coming a day when our works are going to have the blowtorch, the divine blowtorch, Hit him. The day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, that's the gold, silver, precious stones, if it abides, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, there's the wood, hay, and stubble, he shall suffer loss. Did you know you can lose something in heaven? Not your salvation. But you're going to find out when you get there, here's a shelf full of rewards. You say, man, that's really neat. I wonder which ones I'm going to get. God says, well, come on up here. Let's, let's put it to the test. Here are your works. We line them all up here. And now, zoom, the fire of the Shekinah comes out and blasts into those works. And you see all this poof and smoke and hear the crispy, crinkly noise. And you look, and down here in the corner, maybe there's there's one little thing that didn't go up in smoke. And you look at the shelf of rewards. The angels are moving them all out of the way, and here's one little teeny thing. Ah, you get that little teeny weeny plastic trophy. <laughs> coming, folks. It's coming. He shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. You make it through. You're on the foundation. You're on Jesus Christ. But everything that you've built up around you in this earth, this world, you know, the things that you thought were so important, the things that you hoarded, the things that you accumulated, uh, the things that you put so much time and interest and intense energy into, What's it worth in eternity? <coughs> How are you spending your time? We're going to come back to that in just a moment. Last week I told you the story of three travelers several hundred years ago riding their camels across the desert at night to escape the heat of the day, and they were commanded to stop and pick up pebbles and put them in their pockets, and they did. And then they were told to keep going and not to stop until they set up camp in the morning. And so when they stopped and set up camp, they looked in their pockets. And the voice had told them, some of you are going to be real excited, and some of you are going to be really sad. And when they looked in their pockets, it wasn't pebbles, it was jewels. 
They were glad for the ones they had, but they cried in their spirit that they hadn't picked up more. That's how it's going to be in heaven, folks. What are you picking up and putting in your pockets? The second thing that we saw was that Paul was observant of his surroundings. I'm going to go through these quickly. That's one of the keys to survival that we talked about the week before. It's also one of the big keys of being an effective Christian, being observant. I gave you the example of Dr. Howard Hendricks in his Bible study methods class. I gave you the example of the great scientist Louis Agassiz. How important it is to be observant. Observation is something that anyone can learn. Learning to pay attention to all the life situations that God brings us into. There is no event in our lives that God has not tailor-made to conform us to the image of Christ. Are you paying attention to it? God brings us through various little crisis times in life as a way of training us for the big crisis when it comes. God gives us lessons so that we'll learn by observation and application. God uses the little opportunities to witness to train us for the big opportunities to witness. If we're faithful in the little things, God will give us opportunity to apply the skills that he has taught us to the big things. The third thing that we noticed was that Paul was prepared. Paul was prepared with content. He wasn't like some of these modern preachers who stand up there and, and talk a lot of cotton candy and boy are they fun to listen to and they tell lots of jokes and everybody's rolling on the floor and they come out and they think that was fun to be there and then they have no content at all. He was prepared with content whereby he could use his time wisely. He had already spent the long, difficult hours studying God's word when he was called upon to use it. Don't expect God to use you if you don't prepare. So, number four, we notice that Paul was creative in applying the content that he had to his surroundings. Creative application is something that I think that very few Christians seem to possess and even fewer try to develop what they've got. Uh, an illustration I didn't give you last week, but let me just mention, I think that evangelist Ray Comfort is one of the most creative people that I've ever seen in applying creative application to evangelism. I've shown some of his videos here in the past. I just purchased a few more this past week. They came yesterday. I'm really excited about that. I've got four more videos that have been put out by Ray Comfort. He is one of the most creative evangelists, one who sticks strictly and squarely to the Word of God, but he is so creative and bold in his methods of presenting the Gospel. I hope to show some of those to you all in the, in the near future. So, if you want to see creative application, if you want to see how to reach your friends for Christ, the evenings that we show those, don't stay home watching TV and lollygagging around when you should be here. Eternal heavenly rewards, I think, hang in the balance. Too many of us are so totally uncreative that we never want to try anything legitimate that is new. There's a lot of illegitimate stuff out there that should never come into the church. But we never want to try the things that are legitimate that are new. The fifth thing we noticed was that Paul's motivation was spiritual. Spiritual, not carnal, in the things that moved him to action. Remember, move and action. Key. That's where I started this evening. Remember those two words, movement and action. Something that never moves is probably dead. The sixth thing that we noticed was that Paul was open and willing to confront the people who should have been doing something about the problem. And in the text last week, we saw that there were three groups of people mentioned, the Jewish men in the synagogue, the Gentile converts to Judaism, and the pagans in the marketplace. We saw that he was disputing with them, and the word translated disputed is dialogue of legomai, from which we get our English word dialogue. It's the same word that's used in verse 2, where it was translated reasoned. He reasoned with them every Sabbath day. Remember, he reasoned with them, it says, out of the scriptures. He wasn't merely using intellectual argument. He was reasoning with them out of the scriptures. That's the same method at Athens that he used at Thessalonica where he got run out of town. And we saw last week, mentioned just in passing, that word used ten times in Acts. First time it's ever used in the New Testament is in Mark chapter 9, verse 34. So that brings us tonight to verse 17. Blast off to Mars. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. So here he's in the open market, not just stuck there in the synagogue. 
And what happens when he goes to the open market? Verse 18, Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Some other, He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Notice the content hasn't changed. Every time we find the Apostle Paul presenting his message, he's presenting a specific body of content. The New Testament calls it the faith. Whenever you see faith with the word ha in front of it, the, the word T-H-E, whenever you see that, you are referring to a specific body of truth that centers around the person and work of Christ, who Jesus is and what Jesus did. It always contains two things concerning who Jesus is, that he's both God and man, and it concerns two things, what he did. He died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And it's according to the scriptures. Remember, he reasoned with them out of the scriptures. He debated, he disputed with them out of the scriptures. Yes, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, that's Mars Hill in Athens, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but to either tell or to hear some new thing. Can you imagine having so little to do that's all you do all day long, every day? I mean, you must have a big enough bank account where you don't have to worry about anything. You just go to this place where everybody's talking about what's the newest thing. You know, there are a lot of Americans like that. It's all they want to talk about. What's the newest thing? Who's the newest pop star? Uh, what's the newest uh, little cool invention that you can make electronics work and lights and bells and flashes happen and you know did you hear that you know such and such a company is coming out with this brand new thing and everybody's standing in line outside the store for 24 hours in advance so they can be sure to get in and get one you've seen it happen when these new things come out what's the newest thing I don't want the old one anymore I want the newest thing hey sounds like America all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Now, let's apply what we learned last week. Here are those six things. Because Paul was moved to action by the Spirit of God and Paul didn't waste time. And because Paul was observant. We'll notice later in the passage how he observed a very important place for an unknown God. He was observant and because he was prepared, number three, and because he applied creative application, number four, and because he was spiritual in his motivation and action, and because, six, he was willing to confront. He was willing to take the bull by the horns, even when faced by people who spent their entire lives debating philosophy and theology and new ideas. That didn't intimidate him because he knew he had the truth. You do too. He knew he had the truth. Therefore, he made a powerful impact and in the process got another church started. You know, this is an interesting group of people that we see here in our text tonight. Here's how the Bible describes this kind of person. And uh, let me just put a note in here. These people that you see here, they're sort of like the pagan university setting full of wolves that many Christians send our young people into totally unprepared. Especially on the issue of creationism. You know what the Bible calls them? It says they're the kind of people who are ever learning and never able to come to the truth. That's Mars Hill for you. They're ever learning. They're hearing something new every day. They're soaking up all these cool ideas and that cool idea and ooh, did you ever think about this? Ever learning! Would it ever get them to God? No. Ever learning and never able to come to the truth. It's interesting to see that verse in its context because you know in context, always look at things in context, 
in the context over in 2 Timothy it's talking about apostates who deny the scriptures and as a result leave lives of wicked immorality they deny the scriptures and as a result lead lives of wicked immorality just like the evolutionists who have rationally come to the conclusion that if there is no God there is no accountability if there is no accountability standards are flexible there are no standards there's no reason not to give themselves totally over to hedonism all right now let's apply it to us looking back at what happened with Paul here on Mars Hill are you really prepared like Paul was on Mars Hill to reach that kind of a person you might feel comfortable saying well yeah I'd be okay to go into a church and and discuss with them or uh, with with some people who are God fearers already and who know something about the Bible but are you ready to go to the marketplace where you're gonna run into the Epicureans those who just live, live totally hedonistic lives or the Stoics who will look at you with disdain are you ready you live in the marketplace are you making an impact in the marketplace are you really prepared like Paul was on Mars Hill to reach that kind of a person let me give you the context of that phrase ever learning and never able to come to the truth it's from 2nd Timothy chapter 3 beginning in verse 1 notice it's talking about our times this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come this is the kind of people we're going to expect in the last days for men shall be lovers of their own selves do you see that around you in America I don't think so covetous oh that would never describe the United States of America would it covetous I know everybody is doing their very very best to use all the resources that they've got to help other people right hmm. boasters no we never see anybody on television who's not tooting their own horn do we proud we got a few proud people here blasphemers have you ever been anywhere and heard somebody take the Lord's name in vain disobedient to parents Why? American children are the most the stellar examples of parental obedience they yes sir and yes ma'am all the time and they never do anything out of the mm, unthankful you know we live in a society where by it's got an entitlement mentality never thankful so many people that have many things done for them that they really don't deserve and they never bother to say thank you or to write thank you notes I mean that's a thing of the past that's passe after all that costs a card or paper and uh, a stamp and you know the price of stamps today right hmm unthankful unholy why every time you walk down the street what you see is people modestly dressed deep in prayer so they can hardly see the thing that's in front of them that they can stumble over right <laughs> unholy without natural affection what is the affection that God has given that right now is one of the forefronts of battle in the United States even as hit Alabama though it has stood as a state for which I'm very thankful against the federal order to allow sodomite marriages so-called and the whole state is up in arms over it the governor's up in arms the Supreme Court Justice Roy Moore who was thrown out once before by the federal judges and the people voted him back in the Alabama Constitution the marriages between one man and one woman Alabama legislation marriages between one man and one woman the majority of the probate judges who issue the marriage licenses across the state of Alabama 58 of them refused to give marriage licenses to sodomites only nine counties did without natural affection could that describe us in our country 
truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Have you ever run into any of that? Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. Does this describe the United States? Remember, it's last times we're talking about here. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Here's the end result of that kind of position. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. And then our verse, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And you know, he takes it back right there to where we were this morning as we were looking at Moses standing before Pharaoh and the magicians that were there trying to duplicate the miracles of God. Look at verse 8. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, those are the magicians of Pharaoh, so do these also resist the truth. Do you think Paul was facing some people like this when he got up to Mars Hill? I think he was. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. Janus and Jambres got put down. They could duplicate some of the miracles by their demonic power. We talked about that this morning. The kind of miracles that Satan is able to do. But they were made manifest, as theirs also was. Now notice, this is a group of people that Paul is talking to here on Mars Hill. This is a group of people who have absolutely no background in Scripture. This group of people clearly outnumbered Paul. They could throw questions at him from every direction before he could answer the first question. It's all really cool video of Ray Comfort maybe 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. He's been around for a long time. Uh, standing on a university campus on a soapbox, literally, <laughs> wooden box, and taking on all comers. He's talking on a microphone, and somebody else is passing the microphone around to different people in the crowd. And they're shooting him with questions, and they're shooting him with questions, and they're shooting him with questions. And he's standing up there answering the questions, just answering the questions. He was surrounded by a group of people, and they were ignorant of the scriptures. Are you ready to do that? Look at something else about this group. It tells us about this group here in the text. It says uh, there was yet a group that was filled with scoffers and hecklers. What did they call him? They called him a babbler. Oh, look at that guy. Babbling away about idiocy. Scorning him. Mocking. Later in the passage it says, down in verse 32, it says, when they heard of the resurrection from the dead, some mocked. Yeah, there were people like that in the crowd. Others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. Question. You and I have a lot more access to training in, years of experience in, the scriptures. This is very shortly after Paul's been converted compared to our lives, having grown up in church, having heard the word of God preached every week, having been through Sunday schools, having been through daily vacation Bible schools, some of us having had Christian college training and education. Are we ready like Paul was ready? How diligent have we been in using what God has entrusted to us? Are you ready to stand in front of a hostile group of professional debaters? Because you are so well prepared that their sneers, their trick questions, their getting off point will never distract you. Are you ready? Could you stay on point as well as Paul? Now I know a bunch of you saw this debate. It was highly publicized and the auditorium was packed full and people all over the world tuned in the night that Bill Nye was debating with Ken Ham, Bill Nye, the science guy, and I think that's a, a great illustration of what we have going on here in our text tonight. Bill Nye is a professional at preventing, uh, presenting a warped view of evolutionary science, so-called, in a public context. 
Ken Ham was a science teacher, but he was armed with the scriptures. You probably noticed how often Bill Nye tried to get off track. But in spite of the off-track questions that Bill Nye asked, Ken stuck to the point. The Word of God, creation, salvation through faith in Jesus Christ alone. He acted just like Paul, bulldogging the same message. Christ crucified, buried, and risen from the dead. Our time is moving on, but I want to get back to heavenly rewards for just a moment. Being prepared like Paul was, the six points that we covered last week had some serious consequences. Serious consequences. The New Testament is covered over with the issue of heavenly rewards. Starting, did you know, with the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm going to read you a bunch of passages in just a moment here. There are good rewards, and there are some very bad rewards. In the Gospel of Matthew especially, Jesus has much to say about rewards. In fact, of the four Gospels, that is the, the Gospel that is loaded with the sayings of Christ related to rewards. Each of the Gospels, as you know, presents different things. The Lord Jesus Christ, in the Gospel of Matthew, has a great deal to say about heavenly rewards. I'm just going to read these three for you. I may pause on a couple of them to, to make a comment. But Matthew 5.12 Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Verse 46. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? In other words, what's the difference between you and the world around you? Chapter 6, verse 1. Take heed that you do not your alms before men to, be, men to be seen of them, otherwise ye have no reward of your Father, which is in heaven. Gets back to the issue of motives, doesn't it? Verse 2. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. They got it now. They're not going to get it then. Verse 4 that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. God's going to make it public. What a fantastic thing. In fact, Christ says that several times. Chapter 6, verse 5, When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. One cancels out the other. You get the reward here, you don't get it there. You get it from men, you don't get it from God. Verse 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Verse 16. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. If you get it from men, you don't get it from God. Verse 18. That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which seeth in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Chapter 10, verse 41. He that receiveth... Now, this is a very interesting passage. I wish we had time to talk about it tonight. But I'm just going to make one comment and then move on. Listen to it. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Now, think about that for just a second. It says that he that receives a prophet in the name of the prophet... It doesn't say he has to be a prophet. It says he's going to receive a prophet's reward, though. You don't have to be a prophet to get a prophet's reward. Isn't that interesting? You know, I think we pass up a lot of rewards that we never, ever thought about. He that received a... We could paraphrase that. A pastor in a pastor's name receives a pastor's reward. <laughs> or whatever else you want to stick in there. 
Don't you think that's kind of an easy way to pick up rewards? How about chapter 10, verse 42, the next verse? Whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. How expensive is a cup of water? Do you understand the importance of motives and the importance of action? It's not doing great big things here, is it? Chapter 16, verse 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. Oh, I'm looking forward to this. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. Rewards relate to works, folks. Works deal with action. What moves you to action? That's what we talked about last week. The Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he shall reward every man according to his works. Mentioned once in Mark, Mark 9, 41, Whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. Luke 6, 23, Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Are you willing to suffer for Christ? Paul certainly was. He understood this idea. <laughs> When they persecute you, are you willing to take it? Because you're doing it for Jesus? Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Verse 35, 12 verses later. But love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is unkind unto the unthankful, and to the evil. Common grace. A lot of people don't like to believe in common grace in reform circles, but there it is. Luke 23, 41. Here's the thief on the cross rebuking the other thief. Here's one of the bad rewards. We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. Rewards tied to works. But this man hath done nothing amiss. Acts chapter 1, verse 18. Speaking of Judas. <laughs> oh my. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. What do you want? Rewards from God are the reward of iniquity. The reward of iniquity was what he had gotten from the Sanhedrin. And falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. Pretty ugly reward, I think. Romans chapter 4, verse 4. Paul is contrasting grace and faith and works and law. One of the main themes, those balance of those two things, both in the book of Romans and also in the book of Galatians. You get paid for what you do. He says that in verse 4, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. You earned it. You owe somebody. You pay them. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8. Now we read that just a moment ago. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Verse 14, If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Chapter 9, verse 17, For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. What motivates you to action? What do you do willingly without having been pushed into doing it? If I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed. I have to do it either way, Paul says. I'm, I have to do it but I'd rather do it willingly because I know there's a reward attached to it. How about verse 18? What is my reward then? 
verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Colossians chapter 2, verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward. Did you know somebody can trick you out of your heavenly rewards? Paul says so right here. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Oh, we talked about being motivated by the Spirit of God, being motivated by the flesh to do what we do. Chapter 3, verse 24. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. You know, some of my kids are going to get more than others. When I die, my estate is not going to be divided evenly. Some of them are going to get a reward based on certain things that they have done and certain things they've not done. Does that strike you as strange? No. It's based on scripture. I encourage my Christian clients when I write their wills to take into account certain things. They are not obligated by law to write their will in such a way that everybody gets equal shares of everything. Because God doesn't write his will that way. There are going to be some who get a reward of inheritance that is greater than the reward of inheritance of others. Now I suspect that after I'm dead, and I won't care at that point, but after I'm dead and my estate gets divided up, that there will be some kicking and screaming and yelling and some of the kids won't be very happy about it. Planned by the grace of God to leave something to my grandchildren because a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. It says so in scripture. But there are going to be some of my kids who are going to get very little. Think, well, what does the pastor have? <laughs> my kids will find that out. My kids will find that out. And as there are tears in heaven because there have been those who have lost rewards, there may be some tears here on earth. The reward of the inheritance. Not salvation, they'll still be my kids. But the reward of the inheritance. Serious issues, folks. Issues that if we are Christians and apply the word of God, we see that it affects lots of different areas of life. Someday I hope to write a book on Christian last will and testament. If I have the life and time to do it at some point. Let no man beguile you of your reward, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. First Timothy 5.18, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. 2 Timothy 4.14 Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Hebrews 2, verse 2 For the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience receiveth a just recompense of reward. Remember there are good rewards and there are some bad rewards. Chapter 10, verse 35 Cast not away therefore your confidence which hath great recompense of reward. In other words, the book of Hebrews has five warning passages in it. They're all about losing rewards, not losing salvation. Some people try to take those passages out of context to say, oh, he's talking about the loss of salvation. No, he's talking about losing rewards. He's telling them, don't renege on your faith. Don't, don't cave in to the suffering and the persecution you're getting right now. Don't go back to the old ways. Don't go back to Judaism. You have Christ. You don't want to lose your rewards. God is putting an end to the old. He's bringing in something that's new. There's a great recompense of reward. Don't cast it away. Chapter 11, verse 26. And here it's speaking of Moses, who understood the eternal concepts versus the temporal esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Now, this was Egypt's golden age when Moses lived. Moses, if he had played his cards right, might have been the next Pharaoh. Think of all the, the incredible stuff that Moses could have had. 
and the power. And there might have even been a pyramid built from Moses. Or it might have been buried in the Valley of the Kings down near Luxor and Thebes and Karnak. He thought, not that the riches of Christ were greater than the riches of Egypt, he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater treasures than the riches of Egypt. Getting shame for God is worth more than everything that this world can offer you. Do you think about it that way? When you face life, is that how you view life? Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense, that is the payback, of the reward. There are the bad rewards too. Second Peter 2.13 They shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that counted pleasure. Remember, what you get paid relates to your works. They shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that counted pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. That's the apostates who sneak into the church. We talked about demon-possessed people in the church this morning. Here's some apostates. Second John chapter 1, verse 8. Remember you can be beguiled into losing your reward? Paul told the Colossians. Well, John talks about it too. Second John chapter 1, verse 8. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, that's works, but that we receive a full reward. I want to receive a full reward, folks. I don't know about you, but I want to receive a full reward. I know there's stuff that I've lost already. I don't want to lose anymore. Then they receive a full reward. How about Jude, chapter 1, verse 11? Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Balaam wanted money. He got it. Three months later, when the children of Israel invaded the land, it says, Balaam, the son of Basar, they killed with the sword. How long did it last for him? That money they got from Balak. For he wasn't able to curse the children of Israel, but he explained to Balak how to send the young women into the camp of Israel, get them involved in fornication, and God would judge them. He got paid for that. And three months later, he was dead. About the book of Revelation. Revelation 11, 18. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Folks, today is coming when Jesus is going to give rewards to the prophets, to the saints. You're a saint. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ, that's how Paul addresses the believers, even at Corinth, where they were grossly carnal, to the saints which are at Corinth. How about chapter 18, verse 6? Here's some of the bad rewards. Reward her even as she rewarded you, a double unto her double according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. Double payment. Hmm. Chapter 22, verse 12. We're right at the end of the book of Revelation here. One of the last things that the Lord Jesus, Jesus is the one speaking in Revelation, remember that. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass, and sent and signified it unto his servant John. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's Jesus who appears in the Son of Man vision. It's Jesus who speaks to John and who catches him up in the spirit so that he can see all the things that are happening in the book of Revelation. And it's Jesus who's speaking here in chapter 22, verse 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man, oh, and listen to this again, according as his work shall be. Remember, there are books that are opened in the book of Revelation. There's the book of life, singular. People are seen in the book of life or not seen in the book of life. They're divided. We have sheep. We have goats. We have those who are in the book of life. 
getting into heaven, those who are not in the book of life ending up in hell. But then it says there are books right after that and they are judged according to their works. There are going to be different levels in heaven. Just like Paul describes the resurrection, one star differs from another star in glory. 1 Corinthians 15. There are going to be different levels of punishment in hell. They're judged according to their works. Jesus is coming. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Do you understand why Paul was so diligent to study and know the scriptures? Why he was so zealous in confronting even those who were professional debaters in the public arena? And he was totally unashamed. Even when it meant he got beaten? Even when it meant he got run out of town? Even when he suffered shipwreck a night and a day I've been in the deep? In all kinds of perils it is scribes in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, even including perils among false brethren. What moved him to action? I think this is one of the things. He understood that the rewards are coming. And he only had a limited amount of time. And time gets getting shorter and shorter and shorter. You know, you're closer to death right now than you were when I started this service tonight. If you've been absorbing things tonight that change your life, this has been beneficial for you. That's going to count in heaven. If it's been a turning point in your life whereby you say, I'm not going to waste my time any longer. I'm going to get busy doing those six things that the Apostle Paul did. I'm going to make sure that I'm really prepared, that I study the Word of God, that I understand the Word of God, that I apply the Word of God, that I'm creative in its application to the context in which I find myself. I want to be observant of what's going on around me so that I'll know how to apply it so that I can have the greatest possible impact for Jesus Christ, not merely in time, but in eternity. Then it's been a beneficial time for you here tonight. I hope so. I hope it's been beneficial for those who are watching us over the Internet tonight. What moves you to action? Are you ready for your blast off to Mars Hill? By the grace of God, I pray that each one of us will be day by day preparing for that opportunity because it will come. And then it will be a question of what will we do with the opportunity when it gets here. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for the time we've been here tonight. We thank you for your word and for its power. We pray that you'll help us to remember that our time counts. That how we fill our time is going to be worth something in eternity if it's filled in the way that most perfectly glorifies Christ. Helps to be cognizant of the fact at all times that our life could end at any moment. Are we ready to go? And are we going to go with joy that we know there's something waiting for us the reward of the inheritance, for we serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Father, we commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our hymnals and turn to our closing hymn this evening, which is number 578.